Hey everybody, welcome to Friday. I hope you had a great week, I know I did, and I'm really looking forward to today's discussion. I'm Kathy Clotes Guest, your host, and welcome to the Improv and Innovation Cafe where we discuss improv and innovation. And I always like to say when people ask me, what's this, what's this series of Google Hangouts really about? It's really not trying to push an improv agenda, although I would love it if everybody became an improviser, but it's really about understanding business challenges that customers face and asking the question, can improv-based techniques help them? Can they get better outcomes? Um, nobody comes to me and says, my comedy or improv is broken. I wish I got calls like that, but I don't. So it's really less about pushing our vernacular and improv uh, on our customers, but really understanding where are they coming from? Can we meet them halfway? Can some of the tools that we have in our toolboxes as marketers and improvisers help them? And that's really what we're going to talk about today. So without further ado, I'm going to introduce my great guests. I'm very excited because I think this is the first time that I've had um, three marketers. There's three marketers and improvisers. We're all marketers and improvisers on this show. So let the hilarity ensue, but first some proper introductions. So first we have Brian Carter, and he is a digital marketer. He is a friend of mine. This man knows more about Facebook marketing than I think just about anybody out there. He literally wrote the book on it and a couple other books, including The Cowbell Principle, which I really love, and Gary Ware, who today is his first time on the cafe. So welcome, Gary. And he is a partner and the VP for digital strategy at Tower 33 Digital. So welcome, guys. Hi. Hello. <laughs> Thanks for having us. I feel like it's one of those, you know, uh, what are twin powers activate, but it's more like, you know, improv triplets. <laughs> powers activate. <laughs> Form up a bucket of mucus. Yeah. <laughs> well, you never know what random stuff's going to come up. Well, let's, all, <laughs> let's jump into it. Um, one of the things that I, I've been wanting to have this conversation for a while, as, as Brian knows, and I, and I spoke with Gary about it, is we're sort of at this precipice as content marketers with there's so much content out there but are there the right types of content and we know from studies done by marketing profs and the content uh, marketing institute that over 90 percent of marketers put content marketing as a huge priority and yet people are overwhelmed by it we don't know if we even have the right kinds of content that maps to the buyer's journey and the funnel so uh, what do you say, guys? What are you seeing in terms of what are some of the common challenges that you see out there for customers in this space? I'll kick it off. I think one of the big things is as marketers, we think we know best and we think we know exactly what our, what our customer wants and we know our product, so we're too close to it. So we think uh, when creating content, this is going to be perfect for our audience and we take a moment, we forget to take a moment to step back and really uh, understand where our target audience is coming from and where they may be in that journey. Hmm. Yeah. yeah, and that all that marketing automation stuff, whether you're using Marketo or Alicor or whatever you're using is really complicated and I mean I, I think that there are some enterprises that, you know, big companies that that have started to use that and then so they like you said they may have like standardized all their the stages that their their prospects are in from from first touch and at the top of the funnel, like where you might have really buzzy, exciting content, down to like, well, how do we get them to actually convert or how do we get them to become an email for us? Um, so from what I'm seeing in some of the audits that I've done with, with companies is that they have, they may have a bunch of content, but they haven't mapped it out to those, to those buyer journeys. Um, and I think until you do that and you go, what's this piece of content's objective and who is it for at what stage, then you don't realize where the gaps are that yeah. you need to fill in. Yeah, that's such a really important point because I think for so long, I think marketers, to Gary's point, we assume things and we assume that the buyer's journey was this linear thing and it's not. <laughs> it's like random, it's all over the place, people come back, they don't come back for a long time and I think we're dealing with a completely random access, non-linear sequence for a lot of customers and we know the, the, the stats, according to Forrester, that the, the buyer's journey can be anywhere from you know, two-thirds to 90% done before a customer even contacts a company about their products and services. So 
we, I, I, I believe, we don't fundamentally understand the buyer's journey in most cases, and that's a big problem because it creates a mismatch, you're right, about the kinds of content we need. So I think we're swimming in content. I don't think it's that we don't have enough content. I just think we have a lot of bad content out there <laughs> that's not helpful. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, there's a lot of people who are ticking boxes. They're like, oh, we've got blog posts. Tick that box. They're right. not looking. Is this high-quality blog posts? Or what kinds of blog posts? Are these blog posts leading to conversions? You know, yeah. and, and I think coming from outside as a consultant, you get to see that sometimes the, the organization is stagnated in certain ways, and yeah. they may or may not be asking the right questions. And even if they are, sometimes the person that's asking the question, it's not really making an impact on the other yeah. people. Yeah, exactly. Or they don't know their audience. They mm -hmm. think, you know, oh, we're trying to meet or attract VPs or C-level X, Y, and Z. And are they truly the people that are going to be discovering your product or service and then recommending it to the VP? Right. Yeah, yeah you got to think complex sales, like what, you know, who are all the stakeholders and what are their concerns and how are you going to answer those concerns with your content? Yeah, agreed. Well, and, and before we sort of jump into how, how applying improv might help with at least topics, why do you think, because I've been thinking a lot about this question, I know you both have, because you swim in this, this pool every day, it's why do you think companies um, are not coming up with more innovative ways to rethink content? Why are, why are we stuck at this very superficial level of content? Um, and not understanding, especially like branded content, which a lot of brand, branded content is not always that helpful in the yeah. funnel. So why are we so stuck and not coming at content in really innovative ways? Why do you think that is? Well, I think it starts where you don't know what you don't know, and so where do you turn to? You turn to things like Forrester or eMarketer, and then you look yeah. at stats and you say, oh, these are the successful people, this is what they're doing. Like as Brian mentioned, all right, blog posts, check white papers, check, yeah. and you're just too yeah. rigid, and you don't take time to develop your own brand and figure out what your personal audience is looking for. Yeah, yeah and I also think, I mean, I think companies have been asked, like, pretty quickly, become publishers, you know, become entertainers, and they, they may not, I mean, do they really have, they don't have a chief entertainment officer, they don't have, do, are they hiring people who are really interesting and or have any talents like that, you know what I mean? Um, and sometimes the, the writing talent, they may have a, a sort of a nonfiction writing talent, but not one that's really interesting, you know? And I, I mean, I think coming from a couple backgrounds, like the, the improv, you know, comedy, and then also copywriting, like where you learn, okay, these, like, these are different, different words are going to have different effects on your audience, all that kind of stuff. Um, I don't know if some of those basic understandings are, are there for the people that are working in all these companies. So, um, yeah, it's kind of, <laughs> I mean, I don't want to make all these companies sound horrible, but, it, but you know what I mean? You have to, you have to be thinking, if you want that kind of crazy content, you have to be trying to, thinking, like, how can I get outside of the box? Like, what, what could I do that's different? And it just, it does seem like a lot of people are going, oh, well, this is what a blog post looks like, so we'll do this. Or, right. oh, this is how videos look, so we'll do that. You know, so they're just they're copying rather than innovating. Yeah, I think that's that's really true. And I, you know, I, I look at somebody like BuzzFeed, and I go, you know, they do such a great job at really creating entertaining content. And I love the idea that you just said. You know, before we jump into the improv side, you know, they don't have anybody that knows entertainment, and they don't have anybody that knows copywriting. It can marry the two. And I mm. think that's really important because at the beginning of that funnel, you know, we're not at the education point. We're not further down the funnel. We're at the top of the funnel. Um, it, we're, which is, you know, a, a jargon word and is about as jargony as we're going to get today. Uh, but it's an important concept because concept not educate and to entertain. It's really to entertain at that point. And for, you know, a lot of people criticize BuzzFeed, but they're doing something right. Yeah, you know, I think we could all learn a lot. Yeah, and speaking of BuzzFeed, I remember being in a presentation by BuzzFeed and they said, like us or hate us, we know our audience, and we know that the if you produce the right story that is for the right audience, it will find it would find that audience, and it will find that person because they're very specific. And I think this is where, as marketers, a lot of times we, you know, as Brian mentioned, we copy, but we don't innovate. And it goes back to what we said in the beginning: if if you don't really know your audience and what's going to resonate with them and what's going to actually evoke an emotion, you know, you're just sort of 
throwing things up against the wall and just crossing your fingers. Yeah, and there's this other thing too yeah. that, in, you know, I've learned in this screenwriting class that I've been in, and, and sometimes this guy, he goes outside of screenwriting and he says, you know, when we're looking at something very specific like how do we escalate this scene or, um, for example, we could write out like 30 different possible escalations for that character at that point in time, um, but what a lot of us do is we go, oh my gosh, we have this problem, we need, we need content, we need a blog post. And so the first thing we think of, we're like, okay, there we go, that'll do it. We stop brainstorming, we stop having more ideas. And I think, was it Upworthy or BuzzFeed, I can't remember which one, they have a, a, a PowerPoint on SlideShare.net about they, their presentation mm. about why they were so successful. It's because one of their rules is you must write 27 blog post titles. Right, and then all together they choose which ones are best. The Onion sits around and just spitballs title ideas before they write any of their articles. So if you don't have brainstorming a whole bunch of things, maybe 30 is ridiculous, but 10, if you're if you're not picking that part of your process, you're going to create mediocre content. I think you're right, and that's a great segue to improv because I think one of the challenges that companies really face is how do we how do we rethink this in a way that we haven't thought through before? And improv is really good at framing and reframing and seeing new things. So what are you seeing or maybe using in your work where you're coming at this idea generation for content with an improv-based way of thinking? What's working for you? What have you seen? Um, I'll kick it off. Um, yeah. Something that we do a lot to get you, as Brian mentioned, seeing things from a different perspective. And it's a simple game, um, as we call it, you know, the common object exercise. Um, you know, you've probably seen this in you know, things like whose line is it anyway, but we just, as a group, we come in to the meeting and we just bring things that we have at our desk, you know, whether it be a uh, stapler or, you know, cell phone or whatever, and then we go around the room and in, in the circle and the first person picks it up and they do something other than what it's used for. So for example, if it's a stapler, they might flip it open and it's a phone. Now <laughs> go in a circle and now you can't use phone. So now you need to think of something else. So maybe you do microphone or maybe you do a saxophone. And then by then it's like what Brian said, it's like getting all those ideas out of there um, so that by the time, it, like especially if you have like five people in the group, by the time it's the fifth person, um, you know, all the like common things that you would normally do with it is gone, so now you really have to stretch your brain to think about what could a stapler be used for that is not a stapler or a saxophone or a telephone. And again, it gets you warmed up. And so I have the strong belief that if you're in the right mindset, uh, the, uh, the mindset of creating ideas, you can you know, continue doing that. Hmm. Yeah. A murder, a murder weapon would be... <laughs> you know, <it's> a, <laughs> how about that? Uh, yeah, that's similar to what one thing I do is forced association. So, yeah. um, you know, if I let, let's say I take two things. How 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 does marketing relate to to dogs? And I write an article about seven things my dog taught me about marketing. Or you know, how does content marketing relate to bacon? You know, you just force yourself yeah. to think of what what possible association could there be? Uh, oh, it needs to be. It needs to have a little fat. It needs to be flavorful. Whatever it is, you're just making stuff up. Um, but yeah, you got to, and you also got to get rid of the judgment too. So sometimes it helps if you're going to do it in a group, or or you're doing it by yourself. Come up with bad ideas first on purpose so you can get the the critic out of your head and out of the room. Yeah, I think it's a really great idea. I, I love mashups, and that's one I think that it's very similar to what you were mentioning, um, Brian, and, and object freeze. We call it object freeze, where I'm from what you're talking about, Gary, and and the idea of mashups is again taking these really dissimilar, seemingly dissimilar objects on the surface of them, and how can we create a service? So if you handed me um, a pencil and you handed me um, a can of soda, could I merge these two into a product? Could I have, um, you know, a, a, a create a pencil that dispenses soda? Um, like an IV, like an IV during the day. Could I? Ha and it starts to start get you stimulated about because the things we we kind of come at the same things over and over again, and we don't lay new tracks down. And the minute we have to sort of get out of the usual and take our product out of the usual context and relate things to our product that you'd never associate, like dogs or bacon or pencils or Uber. How is Uber like my service? I don't know, but I'm gonna find some commonalities. And then I can write a piece of content about 
how to Uberize your business or whatever that mm. is, but it gets those brain cells really stimulated to the mashup, and I call it just a, you know, for lack of a better word, a mashup of two ideas that you're talking about. Right. Yeah. Um, another one is just to first list off like all the expectations people would have of either a medium like blog post or video or whatever, all the or of topic or whatever. List all those expectations and then say, what is the opposite of this? What's the last thing you would ever expect to see in this realm? And 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 try to bring that into the picture. Yeah. Yeah. That's a that's a great way to go. There's there's a there's another tool that I like, and I don't know if it's so much improv based as it is just um, more of a creativity tool. But what the heck? I'm gonna we're talking about improv, so I'm gonna claim it as improv based. But it, it could be anything. And there's the one that I like is we we how can I ruin something? So for example, how could I make if you're working with a call center, how could I possibly make customer service worse? Yeah. Well, <laughs> I can you know. Name five things you could do, and then flip those. Look for ideas. So maybe one of those ideas will be to forget about a call and leave them on hold for over an hour. And then the flip is, okay, how do I take leaving them on hold for? How can I go start looking for ways to shorten hold time? Or if one of the ways to ruin customer service is to have really bad music, the reverse, the flip would be, how can I provide entertaining, funny things while they're on hold? Can I can I do something fun and different so they're listening to animal noises? Press one if you want to hear a giraffe. Press two if you want to hear a trumpet. Press two, just something that's entertaining. <laughs> yeah. So yeah. come at it from the reverse. How can I make it worse? And then look for ways to flip those and make them better. So it's your brain is coming at it not the same way over and over again. How do I make things better? And after a while, your brain's like, I don't know, <laughs> <laughs> but I know how to make it worse. I know how to make it worse. And then I could go and start that process. Yeah, another one is um, like add or subtract. So, um, like if you're doing product design or something, if you think about um, Twitter, you could come up with Twitter by saying, "Well, what if we made text messages public?" So we'll take one thing and add a feature to it, or whatever. Uh, or, or we could get Periscope by saying, "Let's make FaceTime public," you know, uh, in one way, you know. Um, and shoot, where was I going to go with that? Oh yeah, like or you could take things apart. You could say, what would Amazon be like if it was just a wish list? You know, would a and would a wish list product by itself be uh, something people would use? So um, yeah. taking things apart or adding new things to existing yeah. services. Yeah. Yeah. I That's like a good that. point. Yeah. And I was going to say to add to that. Um, I like to play the game, if this is true, then what else is true? So yeah. taking your audience and saying one thing about them, like so for example, if your target audience, you know, the person that is, you know, that you're trying to reach, um, that they don't have, you know, if they don't have, um, you know, maybe they're just not good at using technology. So if that is true, then what else is true? And then you just start building up this list of, you know, characteristics about your audience so that you can sort of you know, as you were talking about, Kathy, sort of drill in and figure out how you can help them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that and that's a really that's a great game to play to start to really, get, for lack of a better word, kind of delve into a persona, who your audience is, or maybe even challenge some of those assumptions. I think sometimes personas are we can challenge them because we, they're not updated. I, you know, I'm sure you guys see companies all the time where they maybe have outdated understandings of who their audience is. And it's very it's shifting very quickly when you look at Gen Y and who they are and what they do. And a lot of assumptions were made about Gen Y. And it's like, well, let's let's step back, actually, and look at who they really are and, and what they like. Um, and they, of course, like bacon and dogs. <laughs> and so why not Uber or Amazon for dogs? I'm just saying. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You're welcome, Amazon and Uber. That yeah. one's free. <laughs> Perfect partnership. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah, and okay. and if I may, oh, go ahead. Yeah. No, go. No, you please go ahead. Well, and this may I may may, may be like um, anticipating one of your later questions, but but I I think it's easy to use like crazy ideas to create the kind of BuzzFeed content that gets people top of the funnel, um, but you can also take the kind of content that converts like let's say um, a piece of content that makes people worry about making the wrong buying decision and then you know just exaggerate that and create it and like just make it ridiculously mm -hmm. bad like if you buy the wrong server uh, there's a chance you'll create a black hole in your 
in your computer server room and your entire business will be pulled into the black hole and everyone will die or whatever. Just just take a really bad um, thing and, and, and exaggerate it. Um, yeah. And you can do the same thing with like you could, I mean, sometimes one of the things that helps people convert is uh, testimonials from customers, right? So do do some fake testimonials that are just ridiculously good, like that the product or service did things that could never have got me a date, got, found my my soulmate for me. This is the best server I've ever owned, right? <laughs> and right. That, so, so to me, I think hyperbole or exaggeration is one of the best ways to do. But you can start from a piece, the type of content that converts, and and maybe it's both. Then maybe it's both. Uh, BuzzFeedy and helps you convert. Yeah. yeah, I think it's a great idea. Hype mean is such a great and important thing. Exaggeration, you know, comedy on steroids is really, I, I think it's really a great way to think about entertaining, providing value, but I think it's also, I guess as to your audience, look, we get it, and and we know that this is, you know, this is probably not fun for you to have to do research on companies, and hey, look, we have a sense of humor about ourselves, and I think that's the kind of stuff that I love to see from companies. I wish I saw more of it from B2B. So maybe after today, we'll start seeing some more of that. I don't know. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, at the end of the day, I feel companies need to ask themselves, well, what do you want to be known for, and who do you want to be known to? Uh, because a lot of times, it's just so, like, everyone's trying to be known to everyone, and then as a result, you're yeah. known to no one. But, you know, to that point, all right, if you really drill in on that, then you can just keep digging in that area instead of just trying to be known to everyone. Yeah. Yeah. No, it's it's completely true. And I think these are such really easy tips that that teams can use that we're what we're talking about. Um, if you were giving advice to, to teams that are looking to generate new ideas, besides some of the things that we've talked about, what's what's one easy way to just start to think differently um, and get out of the pattern? Because what we're talking about is pattern disruption really. Um, everybody falls into that pattern. I've done it. I've planned my content out so far in advance so that I go, you know, that's ridiculous. I'm not allowing for the fact that stuff happens that could change my content and be in the moment and be real time. So what would you say what advice would you give to to teams that are planning out content? Where should they start? Well, you could shake up the location. I mean, instead of meeting in the same room that you have your serious discussions, go outside or or do a Google Hangout and everybody's in their cars somewhere. You know, just like shake up the look because um, you know lo uh, your your memory and your in your brain is kind of state dependent. It's like you're going to be in. That's why when 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 write when they suggest how do you uh, how do writers write a lot? Have a place that's devoted to writing. How do you make sure you don't have insomnia? Mm -hmm. Don't read and watch TV in your bed. So you know, have a place that is specifically designated for creativity. Yeah. That's a good point. And then I think also on the theme of shaking things up, um, start to explore, as you were talking about, Kathy, things that are tangential to your business but like maybe far out. Like really uh, play with heightening and exaggerating because it's going to get you in a place that is not safe and it's not what you would normally um, think of from day to day as far as content creation. But at least um, it shakes up your brain a little bit, and something's going to land. <laughs> Shake up your brain is okay. Shake it up, babies is wrong. I just yeah. <laughs> just, just so you know. Yeah, yeah, adult brains yeah. is okay. Yeah, yeah. it's okay. Baby it's brains, okay. No. Baby brains, no. Yeah, no, it's so true. One of the things that I, you know, I was listening to a speaker the other day, and it's just such a basic thing. It's like, get out of the office, go for a walk, find inspiration in nature, like do something other than the routine that you're in. So that you can, you know, maybe you're out in nature, maybe you're snowboarding, maybe you're doing in the process of doing one of those things or swimming, you have a moment of aha inspiration that go, oh, you know what? This is a lot like this problem over here that we're working on, and you've got these pieces for content and these brainstorms that come to you. And I don't know about you, you two, but I am religious. I I keep a notebook and I'm like fanatical because I have ideas all day long, and it's like, yeah, I'm never gonna get to all these ideas in my lifetime. Because some of those ideas, well, let's just say, some of them are better than others. But <laughs> and they're not all viable. They're not all gems. But I love the fact that the inspiration can hit you anytime, anywhere. And just tracking these ideas because at any given time, something from that list, you know, that's viable. And I'm right. going to develop that further. And I, I just encourage people to really keep track of that stuff. Mine are all in my iPhone in the little notes. Yeah, you know. same. I use Evernote <laughs> religiously on mine, yeah. 
Yeah. Hmm. Totally. And if totally. I'm in the car, like I pop on the um, uh, the microphone and I just start jotting some things down, and, you know, start talking about whatnot. And yeah, these little nuggets, as you mentioned, Kathy, like when it's time for ideas, because that's usually what happens. We we sit down and we like work, and then all of a sudden your brain is like, what's going on? But if you've Anytime you've come up with an idea, even if it's not baked, it's just like a little kernel, jot that down so then when you can like sit down and you're stuck, you can go through that and you can start, all right, you know, what is this? And you can start building on some of these. Yeah, yeah I noticed too, like I, Facebook told me that this is the one year anniversary of my whiteboard. So um, once I got a whiteboard, which is funny because I knew I wanted a whiteboard, but I would not actually buy myself one for the longest time, which is stupid, but then I got one. And then... Um, now I I write on it whenever I, whenever I like oh I need to figure this out or whatever I'll just stand in front of a blank whiteboard sometimes that helps um, but then you got to erase it to have something new so I'll take a picture of the whiteboard with my iPhone send it to myself and then I've got a folder full of them and as long as you keep on top of them like you name them or you put them in their their own folders for different topics that's another way to capture and and brainstorm those ideas. Yeah, that's a, that's a great idea. And every chance I get, um, one of the things I'm doing now is when I'm out with a customer or a pro or a prospect, I'll even ask, "Are you okay if I record, you know, some stuff?" And I'll I'll ask them, "So what do you think of this or what do you think of that?" And they'll say things I hadn't thought of, and it's actually really interesting to hear the words that they would use um, because they're going to think about it totally in a way that's not my language, which is good it's going to be the way that they need to hear it and it's like okay so maybe that's the word um, you know they're not hung up on funnels they're hung up on conversions so uh, words matter words matter from a framing a content an SEO perspective and so having them do it it's really um, important you know yeah I agree yeah so you're uh, you're talking about customers I, yeah Asking and I'll ask customers, them I'll yeah yeah, so you, what do you think about the wording of this? What do you think, would this be of use? Would this be helpful content? And it's really interesting to ask people and just give them a minute to think about it because what I find more often than not is that the language they'll use, the words or the way they're framing the challenge is completely different from how I was going to write the piece of content. Yeah. Right. And they're, go and they're going, yeah, I don't see it as a funnel issue or, <laughs> yeah, that's not my issue. That's that, and that piece of content's fun, but, you know, what I really need is, you know, how do I, whatever conversions. Now, can I create a, a piece around, you know, conversion and, you know, sl you know, something around Michael Jordan slam dunking it in conversions. Can I, can I do something around that then? And it completely changes the way that I'm thinking about my content, which makes me think that a lot of the ways that we're coming at content is probably, as marketers, not right. So mm -hmm. it's the, the George Costanza, uh, remember from Seinfeld, and he said, you know, if every instinct I have is wrong, then I should do the exact opposite. <laughs> 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 so I, I think I think it's just really helpful to to go back and and ask customers their wording and their issues. Yeah. Um, yeah. And that requires us to be at a humble place where we realize that we don't know everything. And let's just be completely completely honest, we don't. And if we want our customers to buy from us, wouldn't it be more intelligent to actually find out how they describe things, what they're what keeps them up at night, and then use those exact words and then craft it into our messages? Hmm. That's smart. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm doing yeah. more of that. And it makes a difference. And it's making a big difference actually. Yeah, and I move more towards surveys. I've been using SurveyMonkey a lot. And, you know, so obviously, you can either put out a list of different ideas. You can also have the other and the fill in the blank, uh, and that helps a lot too. And kind of like we were saying, talk to customers. I notice sometimes, like during holidays, I go hang out with my family, and we might I might bring up a business thing at some point, and then just like even kind of like getting out of the normal like space, um, you, talking about it to someone who's not as familiar with it can help. To like whether or not they give you whether or not they give you feedback. Sometimes just realizing, oh, I'm really, really in this world that they're not in, um, can help you re reframe it and help you simplify it. And I like to play a game. Yeah. Will my mom understand? <laughs> because for the longest time, my family thought I worked for Google. Uh, 
the internet, and like you know, the actual company instead of working on Google, it was very complicated. <laughs> like, and then my grandma thought I worked for for Apple or Microsoft. <laughs> she it just didn't get it. Um, and so, like this game, like if, especially if you have a product or something, and it's very heavy in jargon, um, can you describe it to either a kindergartner or Gary's yeah. mom um, in a way that they will understand it? Hmm. Yeah, that's so that's smart. Great. And it's so smart and so true. And it's, um, I was uh, uh, doing a video the other night, and um, one of the participants was my son, who's six, and a friend, a friend's son, and he's uh, just under five. And I was asking the kids, I was like, okay, kids, um, you know, what does this mean to you? What does cloud based mean to you? What does revolutionary mean to you? And I turned to the little guy who's not quite five, and I said, what does cloud based mean to you? And he goes, I hear blah, 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 blah. And I just lost it because I could not have fed <laughs> that line to that kid. I could not have fed it because it was truthful. It was honest. I think it's what a, a lot of adults hear when we hear a jargon. And it was just so brilliant. And I, I think Gary's on to something. I really believe if you want simplicity, ask somebody who's unfamiliar with it or ask a child. Yeah. And I really think go. you really want something fun, you want some good content, go video kids. Ask them about your product to explain your product. Video yeah. that, and I guarantee you it will not only be funny, it'll be smart because word for word it'll make more sense than any social media pundit or any marketing expert. <laughs> yes. And they'll do it better, and there you go. You've got, you've got some fun content and some funny videos, I think. Yeah, exactly. That's awesome. That's like some of those translation improv games. Um, you could just have a the the co corporate guy and then the kid and just do a sentence at a time and have the kid say now what did you hear from that you know that would be hilarious that would be hilarious yeah it was yeah it's it is it's really hilarious and i think that's a great way to to sort of get out of the jargon trap and really get into the human mindset of your of your customer and do something fun create some content and uh, while we're talking about content and blog posts video you know uh, tell your story in video which we all know is really important now um, and you know it's not just about babies and dogs and bacon but I think <laughs> they're always can, good to include though <laughs> great. I, 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 what a doubt create an uber video that has bacon babies <laughs> dogs yes um, you have a corporate think, guy and then what does the kid say and then what does the bacon say yeah well, all, along those lines, what does baby dogs and bacon have in common that your marketing content doesn't? Exactly. It evokes emotion, and most marketing mm -hmm. content doesn't evoke emotion. Right. Exactly. And then that's a therein. That is a piece of content in and of itself, right, Gary? Yeah. <laughs> three, three things that, that these things have that you don't. One of these things is not like the other. You, you're the one yes. that doesn't share. <laughs> How come there was never a commercial with uh, Leonard Nimoy just saying like the emotionless version of it and how stupid that was? You know, that would be funny. Yeah. I think yeah. that would have been hilarious. That would have been. So the so Vulcan first, sales person. Sorry, the, the Vulcan, Vulcan, the Vulcan the salesman. Vulcan. <laughs> and they're out. And they're out there. Yeah. They're out there. Or most the other of them are. thing. That, most of them are. And I, I think the other way to parody is and to create some fun, some fun video. But I think it's great content to start the conversation is to just go over the top as 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 we've all been saying. Interview somebody and ask them to take the jargon like to an eleven, like a Spinal Tap eleven, and just talk like that for you know thirty seconds. And then at the end, you know, at the end of the video, look, nobody talks like that. I mean, if that's how you're describing your product, let me tell you something. And just have some fun with that, you know. Um, but that's a great way to then break that conversation. And if you're going to create content, especially video, use that as a way to, to start a different conversation about your product. Be okay with poking fun at yourself. Yes. Yes. Yeah, that demonstrates confidence. Like, people don't seem to realize that. When you're when you're uptight about your image, you're it, you can it's just as easy to look insecure. You know what I mean? I'm not we sure. Y'all know, know that guy that or girl uh, that we met in high school, and they were like, "No, I'm cool, man. No, I, I don't have feelings." Like, you know, and <laughs> I, I dated that guy for a while. Whoa. <laughs> 
totally true. And I think the world's changed. I think Gen Y really has a different attitude towards fun content, especially top of the funnel entertaining content. And they're looking at the world really, really differently. Um, you know, I I was just dealing with a uh, credit union association on the East Coast, and not too long ago, and you know they were kind of in a panic because their average customer was 52, and 52 year olds don't take out a lot of loans, and they were like, we mm. need to attract Gen Y and Gen Y money. And what they mm -hmm. realized was that the way that they were communicating was completely. You know, 180 had to change 180 degrees because the way they were communicating with boomers just wasn't going to be the way that Gen Y was even going to hear anything that they said. And they thought, well, it's risky for a credit union to do this. And I was like, it's risky if you don't because yeah. the only way you grow is if you're attracting Gen Y accounts and you're not. So you've got to lighten up a little bit and poke fun. And they did. And they brought in an improv group. And the improv group just kind of if we ran the bank for a day, blah, 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 and the improvisers were hysterical, and they, they videoed it, and it, you know, sent it to their, their customers, and it was a big hit, but it was, a, hmm. it was a way to attract Gen Y and say, look, we're different. We get it. You know, what your parents bank at, that's a different generation. It's a little stuffy. We are no longer that. We're not that. Hmm. Yeah, it's, I mean, it's changed... Stand-up is one area that I could see that change big time. Like, even from when I started in 2006 to, you know, last two, three years, um, big, big change in what the audience responds to. They are less tolerant of puns and cute, quick jokes, and they seem to care more about the comedian being an authentic person with real stories, right? They, don't, they want something organic. They don't want something formulaic. And and I think that we're still doing a lot of like content and ads and and, and videos that are still kind of more boomer uh, aesthetic. Yeah, it's too perfect. Hmm. There you yeah. go. Like you need yeah. to allow yourself to be vulnerable, and that's mm -hmm. where the magic happens. Where because yeah. at the end of the day, everyone is going to be skeptical of anything that they hear on TV or on the internet. So if you're actually just being vulnerable and allowing yourself to go there and evoking an emotion, yes, it may, you know, you might get that backlash, but let's be honest, you would have probably got that backlash anyway, hmm. and <laughs> now you're building trust. Yeah. Hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Now, I, I think the generational shift is really compelling, and it's an important one that we're talking about because it is different. You cannot take what worked for boomers and throw that at the wall with Gen Y. It, it does not work, and I think we're starting to see that. And you know, I'm always amazed at, at companies that when they're looking at their contents, they're not planning for that, and I'm thinking, whoa, then you've got a big misstep because – this serious as business, no vulnerability, no entertaining content that makes that highlights how imperfect a brand you are. Um, that's not gonna work. And well, I think some companies are doing it better than others. And some some just aren't getting that message. I think there's more of a threat than there used to be since the internet because mm -hmm. there have been since the internet became, you know, a big deal, there have been more companies that come out of nowhere in a niche mm -hmm. to suddenly have 20, 30, 40% of the market share. Yeah. You know, like Dollar Shave Club is one example, right? Um, a new, a disruptive business model and like really attention grabbing ads and suddenly you're a big player. So the playing a conservative is risky. <laughs> That's kind yeah. of an oxymoron, but it, it really yeah. is. Yeah, and the interesting thing with that is they, a lot, a lot of bigger brands, they look at Dollar Shave Club and then they they try to copy them, but they don't really dissect why they hit the way that they did. They hit because they were authentic, they were very specific, and you know they were having fun. Where mm. like a big brand is going to go, all right, we need a viral video that involves a lot of foul language and blah, blah, blah. And they try to mirror, and they make this perfect video that is like yeah. not interesting at all. Right. right. Yeah. I think when I hear make us a viral video, that's what I want to run. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's impossible. It's like, it's sure, I'll get, I'll get right on that. I'll just enter the, the variables into my viral video calculator. <laughs> you can win yeah. the lottery, too. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I wouldn't be having this conversation if I knew the answer to that. I'd be, I'd already have won the lottery. No, it's, 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 it's such a really important point. Dollar Shave Club, that's who they were. That wasn't a gimmick. 
that's who they really are. In fact, the CEO, as you guys probably know, Mike Dubin, is an improviser. He's an mm. improviser. Mm -hmm. And so he did that based on a, a, an authentic love of comedy and, and improv. So score, score for improv. <laughs> but it was a different kind of company, and it, it does work that way. And I think that's a really important point. It's not just about tactics for your content. It has to be reflective of the authentic part of, of the company. Yeah, you need to be congruent. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, I'm, I'm actually a little bit surprised. We don't see more companies. Some of the companies that have tons and tons of money um, could fund their own incubators. I mean, they yeah. could they could empower and own you know new brands in whatever niches they wanted if they yeah. chose to. They could. Yeah. <clears throat> I don't know. Is there are there brands out there for you that you um, either you know or both of you, Gary or Brian, that you look at and you go, wow, they do a really great job, and it looks to me like they're thinking about their content in really innovative, fun ways. Well, it was Marketo? Yeah. When Jason Miller was there. <laughs> um, <laughs> trying to think who else. Yeah, who else? Um, trying to think of yeah, brands that I really like and and that I notice what they're doing. Um, I have to say, Southwest does a really good job, um, and I like what they're doing. You know, they're all about just being authentic and being themselves, and and yeah, they have this big thing on love. But even if you look at their Instagram feed and the things that they're doing on Facebook, um, you know, they're they're very authentic Southwest. Like you look at it and you're like, all right, that's Southwest. And love them or hate them, you know, they are you know all about their employees first. Uh, because their belief is if their employees are happy, they're going to give really good customer service, and you know it, it definitely shows. Yeah, they're they're a great brand. I think HubSpot. I like HubSpot. I like Mailchimp. Yeah. Uh, these are these are brands that kind of make me smile. I was I was saying the other day um, in a in a hangout that you know. Uh, I think one of the funniest things you ever saw from HubSpot was when they created a, a piece of they did these videos, employee videos, and uh, it was like you know, with all these meetings going on in the world every day, wouldn't meetings be more fun if they were forced to be in auto-tune and everybody had to have spoken <laughs> auto-tune? <laughs> and they ran, they ran everybody's voice through an auto-tuner, and it was hysterical. And it was like, all of a sudden, it was like, this isn't a meeting, this is a party. It was like, it was hysterical. <laughs> it was really, it was pretty darn funny. And I think they understand their small business audience really, Very really much. well. Really yeah. well. Yeah. And so they did your your take, Kathy. They they took something that is like boring, and they said, "What would make this better?" And then you know, there you go, auto tune. And yes, yeah, brilliant. It was brilliant. Yeah. I, I I realized that one of the things I wanted to do, my aspirational uh, dream for for most of the meetings I'm in, is I want to like do them in the auto tune. <laughs> mm -hmm. And it's whether or not I take the meeting depends. Are you willing to do it in auto tune? And I think that's kind of a litmus test for 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 personality anyway, personality fit. But if, if there was one final thing, kind of thought, that you could give on, on really thinking improvisationally, not just with games, and we've talked about, just to summarize, kind of objects, what use it for something it's not, it's not, its main purpose isn't, like another, put it to another use, we call it object freeze. Um, we've talked about mashups, we've talked about heightening and exaggeration. Um, what one parting kind of tip would you leave for companies to think improvisationally about their content? I would say create incentives for your employees being innovative. You know what I mean? Because there's so yeah. much risk. I mean, just the same way a big company feels like it can be a risk to do something new, a lot of employees feel like it's a risk to do anything different, to stand out in any way. Um, you know, for the same reason a lot of them don't take vacations. They want to continue to prove that they're serious about the business, right? Which makes it harder for people to come up with crazy ideas. So uh, there's got to be, you got to create a culture somehow where people are being at, at least verbally rewarded for coming up with weird ideas and not being, mm -hmm. not being so attached to, I came up with this idea, so whether it lives or dies, it means I live or die, right? Yeah. Like create a little more detachment from the ideas you come up with. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and to build on what Brian said, build a culture that is surrounded by play and the okay to fail. 
Um, mm. You know, because you think about like why improv is fun. We play and we throw ideas out there, knowing that not all of them are going to hit. Um, and when they don't hit, we celebrate those. And a lot of times, we take those failures and we build upon them. And then that's like how you know some of the greatest ideas come from is um, like what we like to say. You know, uh, nothing's a failure. You know, everything's a gift. And I forgot what company did this, but at the end of the year, they gave the biggest award, uh, or they gave award to the biggest failure of the year, and it wasn't like, <laughs> oh. you know, you failed, like, you know, it was just something that was like um, a blessing in disguise, it's like you went out there, you played big, and you put yourself out there, and yeah, it may not have hit as intended, but we did something with it. So again, play and failure, or, you know, as Brian said, a lot of times we're rewarded for playing it safe, and, and you know, but there's no risk in that, there's no reward in that. Yeah, I think it's well said. I, I, you, you, hit, you said the word play, which is music to my ears. I think that's so important because I think when, we, when I step back and and say why is an improvisational approach so important here, and I think you nailed it. It's really play. It's play. If if we can come at these things in a playful way, um, and and you know encourage and celebrate people trying different things, and you know whether you love them or hate them, like you said, Gary, BuzzFeed gets it done, and they celebrate and they try different things, and they're constantly trying new things. Some of which are going to stick, some of which are not. We don't see those. We just know tremendously how successful they are with a lot of their headlines and their content because they're coming at it with so many different ideas, and they're generating, to your point, Brian, twenty, twenty-seven titles, and they're they're trying different things. And I don't know if this is a company you're thinking of, Gary, but into it out here, and they make very unsexy, you know, financial software. They're a very unglamorous product company. Sorry, into it. You're a great company, but your product <laughs> isn't—it's kind of unsexy. I'm just yeah. gonna say, but but they are a great company because what they used to do, and I don't know if they still do it, but they used to have a um, every time there'd be a product failure, they would have a party, <laughs> and they would celebrate not the failure, but what did we learn? What did we learn? that we can take with us to do it better next time. So they didn't see, and part of the reason for that was they just wanted to create a culture where people did not fear failure. And it wasn't a scarlet letter that kept people from trying, but they would keep innovating, keep innovating, keep trying new things until something worked. And that's such a smart way to go. You know? Yeah, and Geico is coming to mind too a lot. They have so many different yeah. commercials. It's, exactly. it's really, really cool to see that. Yeah, no doubt about it, no doubt about it. Well, where can people experience uh, learn more about you, find more, out more about how great you guys are. Um, Brian will go first. Tell us where people can experience more of Brian Carter. <laughs> go to BrianCarterGroup.com. It's got all kinds of stuff. Got my funny video in the speaker section and all the services and stuff that we do. BrianCarterGroup.com. Awesome. And Twitter is at Brian Carter. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to throw that handle out there. Thanks. Gary, where can people find out more about you? Yeah, so on the... Um, uh, digital advertising side, as I said, uh, or as you said, Kathy, I am a partner at this digital advertising firm called Tower 33 Digital. So that's uh, Tower 33 Digital, or yeah, yeah, Tower 33 Digital. Uh, we were one of those cool people, I guess, that got one of those new top-level domains. Um, you so you can see us there. And I'm working on a new project uh, that's on the line of play. And because mm. I come from an agency background and there's a lot of burnout and stress that comes with this. So I'm, I'm working on a project that's going to be launching soon called the Institute of play.com. And the focus is going to be how to play more and work less. So it's going to be applying a lot of the stuff that we talked about improvisation and uh, silliness as a way to uh, reduce burnout. So you can check me out there and I'm on at Gary Ware on Twitter. Yeah, well, sign me up because when that comes, you launch that, uh, we'll bring you back because whatever that is, let's bring more silliness. Let's yeah. let's bring that back. Um, and you can find me, everybody, at keepingithuman.com. My Twitter handle is at Kathy Cloak's guest, no hyphen, cleverly. I'm using my name without the hyphen. Thanks, you guys. Have a wonderful Friday, and go out and play, everybody. Playtime. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> Yay. <laughs> All right, improv powers, our tri trio powers, activate. <laughs> 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 Thanks, guys. Thanks. Bye, guys. Fun.